Hello, everybody, and welcome to an abbreviated edition of Sports Speak, episode 86. Hope you're doing well. I'm Eddie Kalegi. And I'm Tim Moore. We got a bit of a wild setup today. I'm not even on Wi Fi. I'm on a hot spot in my car in the garage at Rutgers, but I wanted to get a show in because we got a lot to talk about. Tim's not going to be joining us for our second show this weekend, where we'll be talking uh, Super Bowl preview, which will be dropping probably Friday night. But I did want to get a Super Bowl pick in. But first, we've got two big things to talk about. First of all, the NBA trade deadline and then the NASCAR clash. But let's start with the NBA trade deadline. Looks like everything is pretty firm right now. We're recording this at 3.37, which means the deadline ends in 23 minutes. Reports are the Lakers are not trading Russell Westbrook. The Knicks are not making any deals. A couple of interesting trades today. Serge Ibaka goes to the Bucks. Kristaps Porzingis and Spencer Dinwiddie, which I don't really understand that deal at all. Dinwiddie now going to Dallas. He left the Nets because he was mad that Kyrie Irving was holding the ball all the time now he's got to deal with Luka Doncic and then we all know the Sacramento Kings I don't understand what they were doing getting rid of Tyrese Halliburton for DeMontis Sabonis don't really know the direction of that franchise Portland in a rebuild but we got to talk about the big trade uh the elephant in the room James Harden going to Philly Nets get a haul back Ben Simmons coming back along with Seth Curry Andre Drummond and two draft picks and I just want to say to be honest I know there are, I'm a Nets fan And I also have to deal with some Sixers fans tonight that are going to be pretty hyped about James Harden. But let me just be honest here. This was a win for the Nets because James Harden was absolutely not going to stay in the offseason. And the the fact that they got anything back for him, the fact that they got it to the extent that they did, I think it's still pretty good for this team going forwards. I know that trade didn't work out. I know it hurts that Karis LeVert and Jarrett Allen are both gone and now both reunited in Cleveland, a team the Nets have not been able to beat even during this whole period where they've had a big three. But you get Ben Simmons, who I think is going to fit well with this team because he doesn't have to shoot. He doesn't have to be a scoring guard like he was kind of asked to be in Philly. And that's not his style of game. He can be a facilitator and give Kyrie Irving more reins to be able to shoot the ball. Um Joe Harris is going to be healthy soon enough, but now you have a lot of spot shooters, Harris, Seth Curry, and Patty Mills. And then you bring in a big man in Andre Drummond. The Nets have been lacking a true center outside of Nicholas Claxton ever since they traded away Jared Allen. So in the end, I think it's a good move for the Nets. And of course, great move for the Sixers. Joel Embiid finally gets a scoring superstar to work alongside him. So uh, very rare that you see really a win-win deal, but I think when it's all said and done, Tim, that's what exactly we have here between the Nets and Sixers. Yeah, I'm going to have to agree. I think it's a win-win deal. And honestly, I know the Nets right now sitting at eight seed and they're, as of the moment, you know, competing for a play-in tournament. But I still truthfully believe that this team with Kyrie Irving healthy, with Kevin Durant healthy, is still somewhat a title contender. And the fact that, uh, you know, and I was thinking about this in my head too, you know, going back to two, three years ago, even even when we started the show, you know, the whole debacle between Chris Paul and James Harden, who was the problem, for example, in Houston. The, you know, it's funny how it goes back and forth because you hear the rumors, oh, Chris Paul is a terrible teammate and so on. But yet James Harden himself tends to continue to be a diva. And it's like, in my head, it's like I wanted to believe James Harden's changed and so on. But it really makes me want to think in my head, James Harden, for the record, was the problem. And for the moment, it's going to be that way in my head, that James Harden is the problem, not because he left Brooklyn, but just the fact of he complained, whatever. He was still producing solid numbers, don't get me wrong. But outside of the fact that you, you do this, say you want here and you want out, yet now, here we go, three, four places later, he's almost fallen to pass Russell Westbrook, as sad as it sounds, of he's in a place one year and he'll be out the following year. And, you know, the big thing for the Nets here, I will say this, I forget, was it three or four picks they gave for Harden initially? It was three re- picks plus, I think, one or two pick swaps. So, So in realism, Yes, the Nets don't get everything they get back for James Harden, but the fact that they even get two first-round picks is, to me, absolutely remarkable. Because if I were to draw up this trade, the first-round picks, if I'm being honest, definitely would not have been you know, in the picture. If they were doing a straight-up trade for Ben Simmons, which, for the record, I know they needed a package for Simmons, but I'm saying if you're getting Ben Simmons, the, the fact of the matter is I would have thought they would have been getting just depth pieces, not picks. But yet all of a sudden now, Sean Marks looks like an absolute genius yet again. You know, obviously I know the big trade for for Harden didn't work out, but the fact that he's still able to provide future depth now for 
this Nets team and the fact that they're able to get these big pieces. I mean, think about it. These, these last few shows, we've been talking about, you know, the Nets and concerns and so on. And that my biggest criticism of them is the fact that I feel they've been lacking depth. And outside of their starting five, they they aren't able to provide quality minutes. Obviously, I know the Harris injury and so on. But the fact of the matter is, and you pointed out, you know, you have more spot up shooters. You have more productive players. And the big thing is, and I agree, the Nets needed a big guy. And Andre Drummond can still very much be that big guy. Don't get me wrong. He may not be as good of a defensive player as Jared Allen. But the fact is, the fact of the matter is, everywhere Andre Drummond has gone, he's been a productive player, even on bad basketball teams. You look at the Pistons, obviously the Cavaliers last year, you know, going through their whole turnaround for this year. But the fact of the matter is, I think Andre Drummond may be the biggest piece, in my opinion, um, in this deal that's going to go very underrated because I think Andre Drummond could carry this team a long way. Obviously, I know Blake Griffin hasn't really lived up to expectations. You know, you look at the Aldridge deal and so on and, and trying to keep these guys healthy and so on, which is great. But the fact that they can just get a little bit more depth makes me really believe that, you know, yeah, Philadelphia, they got themselves a score, but in the big picture, how much depth they lost. That's going to really, really hurt them. And I know they're competing for one seed now, but just like, for example, with the NFL this year, the NBA has been utterly unpredictable. I don't think anyone could have thought the East would have been struggling this much record-wise. And really, a lot of teams, when you think about it last year, you know, a lot of the top seed teams didn't have 10, 11 losses into this point in the season. I know we're 50 games in, but the fact that we're talking about teams that have nearly 20, 30 losses that are barely 20 games above 500 feels like it's been almost unheard of for the last four or five years when you think about it so the fact of the matter is yes the nba is more balanced don't get me wrong uh than it is without you know the big threes and so on but i i don't think anyone could have predicted the fact that the you know the the east would be as weak as it's been and again i, I think the six years yeah you gotta you gotta score but i just i don't know I, it, it's it's a big player yeah one player can make a difference but when you lose the depth I truthfully believe they are now no different than the Brooklyn Nets. I know, obviously, Ben Simmons wasn't playing, but to me, they now look no different because they need that size, and that that's what builds them. Yes, you have Embiid. Yes, now you have Harden. That's, I mean, to me, you're, you're losing big pieces right there. Now, one key I will say for Philly is that they were able to keep both of their young stars, Tyrese Maxey and Matisse Thybul, who have both – highly exceeded expectations coming out of the draft there was rumors that the nets were going to de demand one of them and as early as this morning supposedly wanting matisse Thybul was kind of what was holding this up and that's why philly had to throw in the two draft picks now for brooklyn to accept the deal so i, I don't necessarily agree with you that the sixers are in the same position as the nets because they did only give up two players that were active right now in seth curry and andre drummond and andre drummond is not nearly as key of a piece for the Sixers as he is for the Nets, because of course the Sixers have an all pro star center and the Nets best center, I guess is Nicholas Claxton who always deals with injury. LaMarcus Aldridge, of course, retired last year and Blake Griffin has been a major disappointment since coming to Brooklyn. But one more question on the NBA front, before we get to NASCAR and get your Super Bowl pick at the end, you mentioned how balanced the Eastern conference is. We know the bulls are playing great. DeMar DeRozan is an all-star. Cleveland adds a Jarrett Allen, Karis Levert combination, which pains me as a Nets fan to see that, especially since, like I said, Cleveland beats Brooklyn. But I, I, it's just tough. And when you have the Milwaukee Bucks and you have the Miami Heat already there as well, with the Nets and Sixers, do you think either of these moves are good enough to potentially move them on to, uh, you know, compete for an Eastern Conference title? Absolutely. I think that I think that these moves again, I, I know where the Nets currently sit in the standings, but I truthfully believe they're a lot better, for example, than a lot of the teams ahead. And you know it's funny, again, I talk about every year with championships. Now you mentioned the Bucks, for example. I can't emphasize, for example, how complacent they've been going into this season and overall their record's been showing. I mean, this is a team that should have been dominating the Eastern Conference, yet 
here they are. And I know they lost some key players. I'm not ignoring that. But this is a team skill-wise that is expected to be competing for a one seed. And yet they've been underwhelming this year. And that's just the fact of the matter of it. But, I, I mean, when you look at it, the, again, I think any of these teams, really, I could pick four or five teams that I really could say, say, hey, I could see them in the Eastern Conference Finals. I mean, you, you can look at the Bucks. You could say, hey, I think they could be there. I still think the Nets obviously can be there based upon this trade. I think obviously the Sixers can be there. And you can fill, I mean, hey, if the Cavs get the right run, and I know that sounds absolutely insane, but they have a possibility. You know, I, I know there's a lot of teams in East. I know I can't ignore the Bulls. The Bulls, I mean, I, I believe too, the Bulls can absolutely be in that Eastern Conference champion or in the Eastern Conference championship game. So th- there's a lot of plugging and filling in right now. But when it's all said and done, you've got to play your best basketball. And really, after this whole All Star break and so on, you've got to play your best basketball then this season. And I think that those teams that really turn it around past All Star break, those are the teams specifically in the Eastern Conference. I think we're going to be looking at competing for an Eastern Conference championship. But this move was the first step for both teams to say, hey, we have an opportunity to win now. This is what we need. And we'll see. I mean, who knows? We could be seeing these two teams stay on their track and, you know, the Nets can win their play-in tournament and and they'll be playing in the first round against the 76ers. And we could be having what we could think as an Eastern Confer- uh, Conference championship battle, you know, in the first round. So you never know. But uh, I think that these are the two teams I still would be looking at to, to somehow, some way find themselves into the Eastern Conference Championship final. And let's not forget last year in the second round at Eastern Conference playoffs. I mean, Nets and Bucks, many would argue those were the two best teams in the postseason that matched up and it came down to the wire there. Um, but of course, we'll have a lot more to talk about of the NBA, about two months left in the season. A lot of deals, very active trade deadline compared to the last couple of years. Just some others to hit on CJ McCollum, no more in Portland. He heads over to the Pelicans, a nice move for them. Uh, the Trailblazers are really looking like they're in a rebuild, but Damian Lillard, at least for now, staying committed with Portland as he continues to do with that, with that team in that front office. Sacramento Kings trading away Tyrese Halliburton and Buddy Heald. They bring in DeMontis Sabonis in a very questionable move. Um, Celtics traded away a bunch of players today. They brought back Daniel Tice, but Dennis Schroeder goes to the Rockets. Ennis Freedom, I, I keep forgetting to call him Ennis Freedom. Ennis Freedom went to the Rockets, but supposedly they're going to waive him, so he's going to be a free agent. So that's a big out there that some team might be interested in. And the Lakers do nothing. Um, so that's that's an interesting move. I don't think there was going to be any takers for Russell Westbrook anyway, but I thought the Lakers would try to do something. They do not. They're three games below 500. They're ninth in the West in the play in tournament right now and just got blown out by the Milwaukee Bucks. So we'll have to see two months left in the season, but this is one of the busiest times in sports of the year. And of course I want to get your take now that the NASCAR clash is in the books. And let me start. I, I liked, I liked this event. I think having it at the LA Coliseum was great. I think it worked out having it at a short track. I think it was fun. Fans wanted more short tracks. Guess what? You get it in an innovative way in one of the biggest cities in the country on one of the biggest stages. And that was on full display with the fact that the clash got its best ratings in six plus years. Um, Really good numbers for NASCAR overall. And I'm just pretty impressed overall that this clash worked out the way it did. I know there were some drawbacks. Fox did not do great with their cameras and their production, which is baffling because this is at the LA Memorial Coliseum where USC plays, where the LA Rams played for five years, where Fox had cameras in regularly for both NFL and collegiate football. I know they stuck a racetrack in there, but the cameras were pretty bad. Also, that Grand Marshall situation was completely cringeworthy with them uh, not timing it correctly. And I'm sorry, but if you have Gus Johnson doing the driver intros, you'd think there'd be a little more excitement there. I don't know. It was, it was, that was a bit of a letdown, but I don't think the the pre-race halftime concert were all that bad. Some people were worried about that. I don't think it really killed the momentum that much. And overall it was solid racing for a quarter mile track. And for the first race of next gen, there were some bugs we saw with these cars, a couple of mechanical issues, especially for Tyler Reddick, who looked to be arguably the best driver in the race. So some things we're going to have to look at, especially with the parts shortage and the car shortage here as we begin the next gen era. But overall, I think it was a good move for NASCAR. I think it worked out well. And I'll be interested to see if maybe this is something they try again at the LA Coliseum or if they try going to some other stadiums in the future and try something similar. 
but that was the perfect venue to kick off the 2022 season and the next gen era. And I'm excited to see the Daytona 500 next week. We'll have a Daytona 500 preview next weekend to get into all that. But Tim, I want to get your impressions from the LA clash. Yeah, you know, when we did our SECs last week, my expectation was that this was going to set the tone for the future in NASCAR. And I do have to say, while none of our picks did anything spectacular, um, you know. I, mine didn't I, even make it into the main event. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> which I'll argue, again, that Heat 4 was arguably one of the most displayed uh examples of short track racing yeah, yeah. That, that's the best way i mean the best two cars rather than if, if for those watching that may have not seen it the heat race and so on in the afternoon uh before the main event this final uh, the final heat the best two cars by far throughout the field kurt bush and alex bowman which was your pick and of course my favorite driver will not ignore that but the fact of the matter is no biasness they arguably had the best two cars in that field but the accidents kept coming, the restarts kept coming, and they kept getting shafted out of the way. Now, I do want to say this. When it was all said and done, my one concern, and obviously I mentioned a part shortage and so on, I did not like, the only thing I will say negative for the record, uh, that I did not like is that I did not enjoy the fact that cars easily, and I mean easily, even with these better bodies, DNF'd and faced terminal damage, from soft hits to the outside safer barrier. To me, for example, the way Alex Bowman DNF'd, I know he made a little nose contact. That's not the reason why he DNF'd. It was from the rear impact to the outside wall, which was relatively soft. The, bo the body didn't even get dented, but it was enough to rip apart stuff internally that he had no brake pressure, uh, no, no brake pressure or pressure at all, and ultimately ripped out lines and so on. So to me, that's a little bit concerning because yes, I know they're hard angles and so on, but that's at 60, 70 miles an hour. That's highway speeds of what we do in real life on the road. So the fact of the matter is that, that if that's ripping apart cars, I don't want to think about Daytona in that regard because that means you'll have guys maybe put themselves in a wall to miss a wreck, you know, slow down and so on, and they'll destroy their car. Or you'll have people so on, which, again, it's interesting because we saw, for example, Chase Briscoe or Ty Dillon. Great, great example in that Heat 4 race. Absolutely drive through people, make contact and so on. And yeah, they were able to withstand front contact. But these sidecar contacts are, are almost absolutely terminal and in, in regards to destruction. And it honestly really reminds me of how, for example, uh, IMSA is doing, you know, with, with their whole series. You look at the Audis and the GTEs and so on. They make side contact. Those cars are destroyed. But the difference is at least those cars show it physically. Yet right now for NASCAR, that's, that, that's the biggest downfall. But I do want to get touch on the LA Coliseum and so on. And, you know, the race was awesome. I, I cannot deny, again, as much as I did not enjoy my favorite driver not being on the track, it, it was a good race. And you saw it come down to the end there. I mean, Lacano, Kyle Busch, class of the field the entire weekend, no, without a doubt. And you saw lap traffic come into play. It was so many scenarios that you just had to enjoy the moment. It was good racing from start to finish. Now, do I believe that? We're going to see the LA Coliseum again. Absolutely. I don't know for the record if we're going to see it as a points event. I still truthfully don't think that'll happen just because of the nature. You know, it, one thing too, I will say getting to see races like this totally makes you underappreciate mile and a half racing. Only for the reason, the fact that you see it's a pushing, shoving fest. It's, it's almost like a demolition derby controlled chaos this track is very very tiny makes you as well appreciate martinsville and the fact that you know people complain about mod half racing oh it's so spread out and so on but you don't see these accidents because you don't see people going full send just to move people and so on and, and that's what the LA coliseum is now don't get me wrong provides great entertainment i just don't know if nascar that's advertising high quality clean racing can have this as a consistent points event with the size of the track the size of the stadium the, the area is not the problem it's the size of the track and and for the record it, it provided great racing for those that were fourth or fifth or beyond and 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 again you saw a lot of great you know moves and bumping out of the way but 
the, the big thing is, is moving forward, I expect the clash to really be in it. Uh, they kind of hinted to for next year. We may finally see NASCAR finally go back out of the country, you know, maybe to do a couple of events. And to me, I'm very entertained by that. But in, in terms of points races and so on, you know, I first off, I mean, the fact that they built the Coliseum and they're not doing anything outside of NASCAR and they're tearing it apart already, to, you know, make it back to a regular football stadium is a little bit disappointing. Not that NASCAR needs to dominate the stadium by any means, but you thought they'd have more attractions there. But I mean, to, to me, for them to go through all this construction and so on, and NASCAR did a great job, you know, but if you're going to go to these other places, I think that you have to make it more than a one-time visit if you want it to be, a, you know, an active thing. And I think that NASCAR should consider, as contradictive as what I said a few moments ago, consider putting races like these on the schedule. But at the same time, you have to make note that I think the track sizes are going to come to a little bit of play so that you're not having, for example, what we saw in Heat 4 on a regular basis, because it will happen. But I will say it did, and this is the last thing I'll say about it, is it made me real impressed to see teams like Rick Ware Racing, have guys like Ryan Priest, Cody Ware be competitive, have underfunded teams really highlight and show themselves. And really the drivers might, might add to very transparent said, hey, we may not get an opportunity to show our competitiveness like this. So the, the fact of the matter is NASCAR was able to highlight these teams, highlight LA and make it enjoyful. And I think they can do it in other locations. And if they want to do it as point tracing moving forward, I'm for it, but they've got to be aware of, you know, with the tracks of what is to come because these teams tore up equipment and with there not being a lot of equipment and the small hits and so on destroying cars, I'm not sure if I'm bought into that if there's not, you know, availability for these teams to, to, to have healthy race cars moving forward. Yeah. But that availability will come over time. I mean, it's just because we're so new to next gen as and there's still developments happening. I mean, there's still changes going to the bodies at this point. I mean, there was recent changes, I think for some uh, slits in the front of the car to be able to get more air in for the driver. Like they're still making changes now. So it's going to be interesting to see, but I think this could have set the precedent. I don't know about a points race necessarily, but I'd also look towards, you know, stadiums that are not really active for other sports right now. Two that came to mind, RFK stadium in Washington, DC. And if they ever found a way to do an indoor event, the Astrodome in Houston, I mean, you've got two massive stadiums that are not being used for many professional sports outside of the MLS in Washington and the Astrodome has basically just become a concert facility. Those are places where you could maybe, and those are great markets for NASCAR too, where you could maybe consider this in a stadium that doesn't have as many, you know, requirements and other engagements that they could be able to put something together and not have to remove it right away. But still, it might be a little too small for stock cars, but I think it was a good event. And I'd like to see this for the clash going forwards. Even if it's not in LA, just try something different. Doesn't need to be another plate race at Daytona where you know you're going to be tearing up equipment. You tore up some here, but it's not as bad as that clash a couple of years ago. But let's finish with this. Super Bowl preview is going to be our other episode. Zoe Alter, Raheel Jaswell, Andrew Bellows will all be joining the show. Tim won't be here though. So I want to get quickly his take as the sun glare is getting pretty bad in this garage. I turned on like one of the lights in my car to get a little studio light on here. But Tim, Bengals, Rams, Sunday, Joe Burrow, Matt Stafford. What's your pick heading into Sunday? You know, last show when we talked about it, I said that I need to stop denying the Cincinnati Bengals and let them finally have their hoorah. But, you know, on second analysis, I think the Rams are going to do this. I really think the Rams are going to win. And it's going to be a close game. I, in fact, think it's going to come down to uh, three points uh, when it's all said and done. Maybe we see Super Bowl overtime for, you know, the first time since Brady's big comeback against Atlanta. But I, I think the Rams can do this. I really think Matthew Stafford needs his Super Bowl moment to solidify his Hall of Fame career. And Von Miller, I think he's going to light up the defensive line as well as Aaron Donald. And 
listen, uh, more than as a Giants fan, for example, seeing absolute disaster of seeing Eli Apple and uh, Odell Beckham Jr. in the Super Bowl on opposing teams, the fact of the matter is I would love to see OBJ absolutely tear it up for for the Rams and and ultimately uh, claim the prize. And again, I, I say this for the Rams too, just chronologically thinking, this is their chance. All, all the buying, all the investing and so on over the last three, four years, this may be the only chance they have left to get a Super Bowl. doesn't mean that their team won't be better, they won't be back, but this on paper is their best chance to do it. Obviously for Bengals too. I mean, let's be honest, today, it's, it, they've gone with the slogan the entire time. No one expected them to get this far, and I really don't think anybody expects them to get this far for a long time after this. Yes, Joe Burrow's great, but that team still needs a lot of help, in my opinion. But then again, we could see, for example, like Washington National situation all over again, or the Braves this year, where a team sneaks their way to a championship and no one expected them to. So, uh, again, I expect it to be three points. I have the Rams, but at the end of the day, no matter who wins, the, you know, the Super Bowl, football wins. You've got it in a great place. L.A. continues to be booming. The NFL is going to have a big Super Bowl there. And sure, you know, back-to-back years of home teams winning a Super Bowl, great. But at the end of the day, you know, the Bengals just got a lot of, you know, publicity, not just because they're going to the Super Bowl, but in a positive way of getting players and showing that their team is turning around. And I really think Cincinnati is going to turn itself to be a big, or I should say a bigger Super Bowl or football market than what it's been over the past few years. And I think this team, you know, with the cap space might add that they still have available, they could get some big free agents this year to really help that team become that Super Bowl product that they, uh, that they excuse me, that they desire. Well, we'll see what happens, and we'll have a lot more to talk about the Super Bowl on our second episode of the weekend. Reminder, we're on Spotify now. Uh, That's linked on our Twitter, also on Anchor, and of course on YouTube as always, and you can follow us on our Twitter at Sportspeak Live for info about episodes, and also our NASCAR Pick'em, which just got started uh, with me and Tim struggling with the clash. We'll be, Tim will be back on next week because we'll be doing our Daytona 500 preview, which should be fun. And we'll be doing some picks for that as well to begin our NASCAR pick them for the 2022 NASCAR regular season. But that's all she wrote. Uh, interesting show today, hanging out in the New Brunswick, New Jersey parking garage at College Avenue campus, of Rutgers University. But uh, that's going to be all for this one. Uh, we'll see you later this weekend for our Super Bowl preview. I'm Eddie Kalegi. And I'm Tim Moore. And this is Sports Speak. Have a great rest of your evening.